All right, uh, <clears throat> so today I'm going to talk about building privacy protecting infrastructure, what it is, uh, why we need it, and how we can build it. Uh, we'll look at VACU, which is the communication layer for Web3, uh, and we'll also look at how we're using CK technology to incentivize and protect the VACU network. We'll also look at CeroKit, which is a library we've been building to make it easier to use signals proofs in different environments. And at the end of this talk, uh, I hope you'll come away with a better understanding of the importance of privacy protecting infrastructure and how we can build it. So first, briefly about VAC and me. Uh, I'm the director of research at VAC, and we build public good protocols for the decentralized web with a focus on privacy and communication. We do applied research uh, based on which we build protocols, libraries, and publications. And we're also the custodians of protocols that reflect a set of principles. It has its origins in the status app and basically trying to improve on the underlying protocols and infrastructure. We build VACU, among other things. So privacy is the power to selectively reveal yourself. It's a requirement for freedom and self-determination. Just like you need decentralization in order to get censorship resistance, you need privacy to enable freedom of expression. To build applications that are decentralized and privacy protecting, you need the base layer, the infrastructure itself, to have these properties. We see this a lot. It's easy to make trade-offs at the application layer than doing them at the base layer. You can have custodial solutions uh, on top of a decentralized and non-consolidated network where participants own their own keys, but you can't really do the opposite. And if you think about it, even something as basic as buildings can, can be seen as a form of privacy protecting infrastructure. It's completely normal and obvious in many ways, but when it comes to the digital realm and mental models and way of speaking about it, uh, it hasn't sort of caught up for most, uh, yet for most people. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the need for privacy or what happens if we don't have it, uh, but suffice to say it's an important property for an open society. When we have conversations, true peer-to-peer -peer, uh, offline conversations, we can talk privately, and we, if we use cash to buy things, uh, we can do commerce privately. Uh, on the internet, great as it is, there are a lot of forces that makes it the natural state of things, not the default. Big tech has turned users into a commodity, a product, and monetized users' attention for advertising. Uh, to optimize for your attention, they need to surveil your habits and activities, and hence breach your privacy as opposed to more traditional business models where you're buying a product and incentives are maybe more aligned. And to sort of build these uh, censor-persistent and, and privacy-protecting and enable these types of apps that enable free, freedom of expression, uh, we need credible uh, base layer infrastructure that have these properties. So infrastructure is what lies underneath. Uh, there's many, ways the, many different ways of looking at it, but I'll keep it simple as per the original web free vision. So you had Ethereum for computing consensus, Swarm for storage, and Whisper for messaging. And Vacuo has taken over the mantle uh, from Whisper and is a lot more usable today than, Whis than Whisper ever was for many reasons. On the privacy front, uh, we see how Ethereum is struggling. Uh, it's a big UX problem, especially when you try to add privacy back on top. It takes a lot of effort and it's a lot easier to censor. And we see this with recent actions around Trinity Cache. Compare this with something like Zcash or Monero, where privacy is there by default. There are also problems when it comes to the peer-to-peer -peer networking side of things, for example, with Ethereum validated privacy and hostile actors and jurisdictions. If someone can easily find out where a certain validator is physically located, that's a problem in many parts of the world. Being able to have stronger privacy protection guarantees will be very useful for high-value targets. And this doesn't even begin to touch on so-called dApps uh, that make a lot of sacrifices in how they function from the way how domain works, to how websites are hosted, and the reliance on centralized services uh, for communication. And we see this time and time again, where centralized single points of failure, they work for a while, but then eventually fail. And in many cases, an individual user, they might not care enough, uh, and for platforms, the lure to take shortcuts is strong. And this is why it's important to be principled, but also pragmatic in terms of the trade-offs that you allow on top. And we'll touch more on this when it comes to design goals and around the modularity that Vacuo has. So, synology proofs are a wonderful new tool. And just like smart contracts enable programmable money, synology proofs allows us to express fundamentally new things. And in line with the great tradition of trust minimization, you can prove statements while revealing the absolute minimum information necessary. And this fits the definition of privacy, the power to selectively reveal yourself perfectly. 
And I'm sorry I don't need to tell anyone in this room, but this is truly revolutionary. Uh, and technology is advancing extremely fast, and it's often our imagination is limit. So what is VACU? Uh, it's a set of uh, modular protocols for peer-to-peer communication. It has a focus on privacy, security, and being able to run anywhere. And it's a spiritual successor to Whisper. And by modular, we mean that you can pick and choose protocols and how you use them, depending on constraints and trade-offs. So for example, bandwidth uses versus privacy. It's designed to work in resource-restricted environments, such as mobile phones and web browsers. And it's important that infrastructure meets users where they are and support their real-world use cases. Just like you don't need your own army and a castle to have a private bathroom, you shouldn't need to have a powerful always-on node to get reasonable privacy and sense of persistence. We might call this self-sovereignty. One way of looking at VACU is as an open service network. Uh, there are nodes with varying degrees of capabilities and requirements. For example, when it comes to things like bandwidth usage, uh, storage, uptime, privacy requirements, latency requirements, and connectivity restrictions. We have this concept of adaptive nodes that can run a variety of protocols. And a node operator can choose which protocols they want to run. Naturally, there will be some nodes that uh, do more consumption and other nodes that do more provisioning. And this gives rise to the idea of a service network where services are provided for and consumed. So there are many different protocols that interact. The VACU Relay protocol is based on LibP2B gossip sub for P2B messaging. And we have things like filter for bandwidth restricted nodes to only receive a subset of messages, light push for nodes with short connect, uh, connection windows to push messages into the network, store for nodes that want to retrieve historical messages. And then on the payload layer, we also have things like uh, support for noise, handshakes, and key exchange. And th this means that as developers, you can get end-to-end -end encryption and expected guarantees out of the box. Uh, we have support for setting up secure channels from scratch, and all of this paves the way for providing things like signals double ratchet at a protocol level much easier. We also have experimental support for multi-device usage. Uh, it's no worth noting that similar features have existed in, for example, the status app for a while, but with this, we make it easier for any platform using VACU to use this. There are a lot of other protocols as well related to things like peer discovery, topic use, and so on, and you can check out our specs for more. So when it comes to the VACO network, there are a few sort of immediate problems. Um, for example, when it comes to network spam and incentivizing service nodes, we want to address these while keeping the privacy guarantees of the base layer. And I'm going to go into both of these. So the spam problem arises on the gossip layer when anyone can overwhelm the network with messages. The service incentivization is a problem when nodes don't directly benefit from the provisioning of a certain service. And this can happen if they are for example, not using the protocol directly themselves as part of normal operation, or if they aren't socially inclined to provide a certain service. And this depends a lot on how an individual platform chooses to use the network. So since the peer-to-peer -peer relay network is open to anyone, uh, there's a problem with spam. And if we look at some existing solutions for dealing with spam in traditional messaging system, a lot of entities like Google, Facebook, Twitter, Telegram, Discord, they use phone number verification. And while this is largely civil resistant, it is centralized and not private at all. Historically, uh, WISP used proof of work, which isn't good for heterogeneous networks. Um, and then things like peer scoring are open to civil attacks and doesn't directly address spam protection in an anonymous peer to peer network. And the key idea here is to use RLAN for private economic spam protection using CK SNARKs. I'm not going to go into too much detail of RLAN here. Um, we have some write ups on back.dev by SNAS, who's been pushing a lot of this from our side. And I believe there's also another talk by Taylor at PC tomorrow afternoon who's going to go into all any more detail. But I'll briefly go over what it is, it's sort of the interface and circuits, and talk about how it's used in VACU. So RLAN stands for Rate Limiting Nullifier. Uh, it's an anonymous rate limiting mechanism based on CK SNARKs. And by rate limiting, we mean that you can only send N messages in a given period. And by anonymity, we mean that you can't link, me link messages to a publisher. We can think of it kind of as a voting booth. We only allow to vote once every election. It can be used for spam protection in P2P messaging systems, and also rate limiting in general, uh, such as for a decentralized capture. There are basically three parts to it. So you register somewhere, then you can signal, and finally there's a verification and slashing phase. You put some capital at risk, and this can either be economic or social, and if you double signal, you get slashed. So here's what the private and public um, input to the circuit looks like. The identity secret here is generated locally, and we create an identity commitment that is in inserted into Merkle tree. And we use Merkle proofs to prove membership. Registered members can only single once for a given epoch or external nullifier. 
for example, every 10 seconds in Unix time. And our RLAN identifier is for a specific RLAN app. We also see what the circuit output looks like, and this is calculated locally. So Y here is the share of a secret equation, and the internal nullifier acts as a kind of unique fingerprint for a given app user epoch combination. How do we calculate this Y and internal nullifier? So this is done using Shamir secret sharing. Uh, Shamir secret sharing is based on the idea of splitting a secret into shares, and this is how we enable slashing of funds. In this case, we have two shares. Uh, if a given identity A0 signals twice in an epoch external nullifier, A1 is the same. And then for a given RLN app, inter internal nullifier also stays the same. X is the single hash, which is going to be different. And Y is public output, so we can reconstruct the identity secret. And with the identity secret revealed, this gives access to, for example, financial stake. So this is how RLN is used with the uh, Relay Gosses protocol. Uh, so node registers and locks up funds, and after that, they can send messages. It publishes a message containing the serial knowledge proof and some other details. Each relay and node listens to the membership contract for new members, and also keeps track of relevant metadata uh, and the Merkle tree. And metadata is needed to be able to detect double signaling and perform slashing. Before forwarding a message, it does some verification checks to ensure that there are no duplicate messages, that the knowledge proof is valid, and that no double signaling has, has occurred. It's worth noting that this can be combined with traditional peer scoring, for example, things like uh, duplicate messages or invalid CK proofs. In line of VACU's goal of modularity, uh, all in really is, is applied on a specific pub su subset of pub, sub, and content topics. So you can think of it as a kind of a extra secure channel. So where are we at with RLAN Relay deployment? Uh, we've recently launched our second uh, testnet. And this is using RLAN Relay, Relay with the uh, smart contract on Gurley. It's integrated with our example P2P chat app, and it does so for three different clients, Vacu, GoVacu, and JSVacu for browsers. And this is our first P2P cross-client uh, testnet for RLAN Relay. Uh, here's a screenshot of a short demo. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to do the demo here. I'll actually do it tomorrow afternoon. Um, but basically, this shows a user registering in a browser and then signaling through JSVACU. And it then gets relayed to a VACU node that verifies the proof. Uh, and when more than one message is sent in a given epoch, it detects it as spam and discards it. Uh, slashing hasn't uh, been implemented fully yet in, in the client and is work in progress. And if you're curious and want to participate, uh, you can join the effort on our VAC Discord. Uh, we also have tutorials set up for all the clients that you can play around with, and that's the QR code right there. As part of this, uh, and in order to make this work in multiple different environments, we've also been developing a new library called SeroKit. I'll talk about this a bit later. So going back to the idea of sort of the service network, uh, let's talk about service credentials. So the idea behind service credentials and private settlement is to enable two actors to pay for and provide services without compromising their privacy. We do not want the payment to create a direct public link between the service provider and requester. Recall that the, sort of the vacuous service network illustration with adaptive nodes, uh, where, where nodes sort of choose which protocols to run. And a lot of these aren't very heavy, and they sort of enable them work by default. So for example, the relay protocol. Um, other protocols are much heavier to provide, such as, for example, storing historical messages. Uh, it's desirable to have additional incentives for this, especially for platforms that aren't community-based, where some level of altruism can be assumed. For example, status communities or wallet connect cloud infrastructure. So you basically have a node, Alice, uh, that's often offline, and it wants to consume historical messages on some uh, specific content topic. And uh, you have another node, Bob, that runs a server at home uh, where you want to store historical messages for the last several weeks. Uh, Bob is happy to provide this service for free uh, because he's excited about running privacy-protecting infrastructure, uh, but he's using it, and he's using it himself, but his node is getting overwhelmed by freeloaders, and he feels like he should pay something to continue to provide the service. So Alice deposits some funds uh, in a smart contract, uh, which registers in a, it in a tree, similar to certain other private settlement mechanisms. A fee is taken or burned. Uh, in exchange, she gets a set of uh, service credentials. And once she wants to query with some criteria, she sends this to Bob. Bob responds with size of response, cost, and receiver address. And then Alice then sends a proof of delegation of a service token with a payment, as a payment. Bob verifies the proof and resolves the query. The end result is that Alice has consumed some service from Bob, and Bob has received payment from this. There's no direct transaction link between Alice and Bob. And gas fees can be minimized by extending the period before settling on chain. Uh, this can be complemented with altruistic service provisioning, for example, by splitting the peer pool into two slots, 
or only providing a few cheap queries for free. Uh, the service provisioning is general uh, and can be general for any kind of request response provisioning that we want to keep private. And this isn't a perfect solution by any means, uh, but it's an incremental improvement on top of the status quo. And it can be augmented with more advanced techniques such as better non-reputable node reputation, uh, proof of correct service provisioning, etc. And there's a lot more details to this, and we are basically currently in the raw spec proof concept stage of this, and we expect to launch a test with this later this year or early next. So SeroKit is a set of uh, Zero Knowledge modules written in Rust and designed to be used in many different environments. The initial goal is to get the best of both worlds with uh, Circum, Solidity, and JavaScript on one hand, and the Rust Seek uh, ecosystem on the other. And this enables people to leverage Circum-based constructs uh, from non-JavaScript environments. For the RLN module, it is using Circum circuits via Arc Circum and Rust for scaffolding. It exposes a CFFI API that can be used for other system programming environments, like Nim and Go. Uh, it also exposes an experimental uh, WASM API that can be used through web browsers. And Vacuous peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure running in many different environments, such as Nim, JS, Go, and Rust, and uh, mobile phones and web browsers. So this is a requirement for us. Circum and JS strings is access to things like DAP developers, uh, tooling, generating verification codes, circuits. Um, and Rust strings is that it's uh, system-based and easy to interface with other language runtimes like Nim, Go, Rust, C. It also gives access to other Rust seek ecosystems, such as Arcworks which opens the door for using other constructs like Halo 2. This becomes especially re relevant for constructs where you might not want to do a sort of a trusted setup or where circuits are more complex or custom and performance requirements are higher and so on. In general with CircuitKit, we want to make it easy to build and use Synos proofs in a multitude of environments, such as mobile phones and web browsers. Currently, it's, it's too complex uh, to write privacy protecting infrastructure with Synos proofs, considering all the languages and tools you have to learn all the way from JavaScript, Solidity, and Circom, and how to write the circuits, uh, to Rust, Wasm, FFI, and that's not even touching on things like secure key storage or mobile dev. Luckily, more and more products are working on this, including various DSLs, uh, and it, it would also be exciting if we can sort of make a useful tool stack for JS-less CK devs to sort of reduce cognitive overhead, uh, similar to what we have with something like Foundry. I also want to mention a few other things we're doing. Um, one thing is protocol specifications, and we think this is very important for peer-to-peer -peer infra. And we see, a lot of, lot of, we see a lot of other products that claim to be doing peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure, but they aren't very clear about guarantees or stable something is or the actual semantics of it. And this makes it hard to have multiple implementations, to collaborate across products, and to analyze things objectively. Uh, related to this is publishing papers. We put out three so far, related to VACO and RLN really. And this makes it easier to interface with academia, and there's a lot of good resources out there, and we want to build, build a better bridge between academia and, research, and industry. Another thing is network privacy. So VACU is modular with respect to privacy guarantees, and there's lots of knobs to turn here depending on sp specific deployments and requirements. So for example, if you're running the full relay protocol, you currently have much stronger receive anonymity than if you're running the filter protocol from a bandwidth or, co or connectivity restricted node. We aim to make this pluggable depending on specific user needs, so for example, mixedness such as NIM, they come with some trade-offs, but are definitely a very useful uh, tool in this arsenal. Uh, a good mental model to keep in mind here is the anonymity trilemma, uh, where you can only pick two out of three when it comes to low latency, low bandwidth usage, and strong anonymity. Uh, we're currently exploring things like Dandelion-like additions to the really gossip up protocol, which would provide for stronger anonymity, especially in a multi-node uh, botnet attacker model. Um, and as part of this, we're looking into things like different parameter choices and, and more generally possibilities for low latency uh, usage. This could make it more amendable for latency sensitive environments, uh, such as validated, uh, validated privacy, especially under very specific uh, threat models. And general theme is that we want to be rigorous about the guarantees we provide, under what conditions, and for what precise threat models. And we have a lot of uh, specs around this and adversary models and so on. Another thing that I mentioned earlier is this noise payload encryption, and specif specifically things like allowing for pairing different devices with QR codes. And that's sort of, it's very useful for developers because we live in a multi-device world and we want to sort of use things from different devices. As a summary, uh, we're going over what privacy protecting infrastructure is, why we want it, and how we can build it. Uh, we've seen how CK is a fundamental building block for this. 
we looked at VACU, the communication layer for Web3, and how it uses zero knowledge proofs to stay private and function better. Uh, we also looked at Circuit and how we can make it easier to do zero knowledge proofs in different environments. Uh, finally, we also looked at some other research we've been doing, and all of the things mentioned in this talk and a lot more is available as write-ups, specifications, or discussions on, on our forum or GitHub. Uh, here's some links. Uh, if you find any of this exciting to work on, feel free to come up to talk to me. Uh, we're also hiring and have started expanding into other privacy infrastructure technology, such as uh, uh, private and provable computation with CK Wasm. And the QR code is a link to our Discord. Thanks. Any questions? Uh, hello. One of the main challenge I perceive uh, in uh, crypto messaging is um, the fact that producers are incentivized to pay to have their moustache broadcasted, but uh, there is no incentive then for relayers to distribute it to consumers that much. And uh, this makes centralized solution usually uh, the outcome, as uh, you want to have something like, I don't know, MetaMask to be able to relay things to users with Infra and everything, which make it, in return, uh, censorship sensitive, where then nation state can pressure decentralized actors into not distributing the message. And if you rely only on peer-to-peer, -peer, you might still need then some very old-fashioned uh, indexer or layer, which can also be centralized to, hey, this message is here, so how do you specifically in your protocol solve this, uh, making sure that there is incentive for the distributor to receive a message? So, okay, so repeat the question. So, uh, if you're in a decentralized messaging protocol, you have consumers that want to receive a message, and as you put it yourself, uh, sometimes they don't really have a lot of resource, they don't necessarily want to verify their identity and everything, but there is no direct incentive for broadcasters to have of the, the private message that these consumers want to send this message to the consumers. They're not getting paid for it. Yes, and so I think we, I guess we're splitting this, this problem up a bit. Uh, it's definitely a general problem if you have sort of some gossip multi-hop model, if you want to keep that private and incentivize that, and in general that leads to sort of very heavy models. The way we are basically simplifying the problem and cutting it up is looking empirically at the problems we see today. And a lot of those problems, as you kind of mentioned with MetaLask and things like that, come exactly when you are in a restricted environment and you have to use some kind of service, some request response kind of thing there. And this is exactly what we're trying to do with the, with the things like the service credentials uh, and these things. And there's also a lot of things going on here when it comes to discovery and like finding and, and, and ranking these types of nodes. But when we look at the relay net network, just like if you look at Gossip Sub, usually the participants in the network are incentivized to sort of relay messages. And furthermore, uh, because of, for anonymity reasons, uh, we are encouraging the use of a single pub sub topic, uh, which means that sort of you're relaying messages in a network in general because you don't um, necessarily know the contents of it. So it's kind of a byproduct of, byproduct of normal operation. So it depends on a bit on what layer you look at it, uh, if it's sort of the normal operation or if you're looking at the edge kind of thing and then the reputation thing is another aspect of it. Okay, so st there is no direct incentive in the network, it's just a side effect of producers wanting more users. Uh, kind of, like there's, there's okay. levels of it, right? There's different types of incentives. Uh, and uh, the really network itself, empirically, it's not a big problem right now. It is definitely a research area and it's not something that we are looking into and we have some ideas around it, but it's not actually a high priority if you look at empirically problems we're having. The problems we're having are more around these kind of edges where there's uh, service provisioning, uh, as well as how you discover things in the web browsers and, and reputable nodes and these types of things. So that's higher priority uh, and, and empirically, but things might evolve and, uh, yeah. Do we have any more questions? Yeah. I have two questions. First is, is RLAM based on Semaphore? Second, second question is, is there any pay gas payment involved in uh, a zero knowledge verification? If if if, if there is, what, how do you prevent from uh, exposing the ident on on chain identity uh, from gas payment? Yes, yeah, so that's a good question. So uh, RLN is you can look at it as kind of semaphore, but then more things when it comes to actually preventing uh, double uh, double signaling. Um, so it's semaphore plus some other stuff to do that and do the slashing and so on. Uh, as for the CK, like CK verification, this is actually something that's a bit different with 
this peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure because it's not happening normally on the blockchain. It's actually you're verifying it on each peer-to-peer -peer node sort of that, that's running this thing. So that doesn't require uh, gas usage. When it comes to slash syncs, if you've detected the double signaling, uh, then you, you have to go on chain, obviously, and interact that, and that will also verif verify the proof. Uh, but you can use the relays and these types of things. But as part of normal operation, you're not actually uh, interacting with the blockchain. It's all happening peer-to-peer. Right. Unfortunately, time is up. Uh, but thank you, Oscar. Uh, again, I'm going to repeat the fact that you can go talk to Oscar uh, outside of the room. So please uh, follow up on our conversation there. Uh, so again, thank you.